North Carolina is somewhat of a unique state. There is no one single air pollution problem that is pervasive in the entire state of North Carolina. In fact, in my judgment, and that is purely my judgment, there are three distinct problems that we have to deal with in the state of North Carolina. So here is North Carolina right there. And if I can break or division the state of North Carolina in the mountainous region, the western part, the Piedmont region in the middle, which is where we are right now, and the eastern part of the state of North Carolina. What is it that we see? The western part is primarily gets impacted by long range transport of pollution, primarily from Ohio River Valley and TVA. So pollutants waft aloft, come to the state of North Carolina, and they impact. And one of the manifestations of that pollution is the Blue Ridge Mountains, the wonderful vistas that we had at one time, are no longer blue anymore. They are getting grayer, and perhaps in certain areas even worse than that. So that's western part of the state. That's what we have to deal with. In the eastern part of the state, it is intensively managed agriculture and the pollution associated with intensively managed agriculture. And what is it that I mean by that? The state of North Carolina is home to 10 million hogs. Clearly, the waste that is generated by these hogs, by the technology that is used to manage the waste, is simply inadequate and there is a lot of air pollution associated with it and that's largely in the state, eastern part of the state. How about the Piedmont? The Piedmont region is, which is where we are at, is where the ozone problem is and there is another one which is particulate matter fine but I'm not going to go there today. It is really automotive issues and the pollution associated with automotive traffic and what ultimately these pollutants that are produced by automot automotive industry is what is causing the ozone problem in the central part of North Carolina. And so I will focus essentially in the issues surrounding this part, which is the central part, Piedmont region of the state of North Carolina. So that you know that indeed there is a long range transport. There is something called back trajectory analysis. That is, we can, after the fact, scientifically figure out where did the air mass originate when it came to western part of North Carolina. So on this particular day, which is July 12, 1995, you can see that western part of the state of North Carolina was impacted by this air mass. And so full one third of the time in the western part of the state of North Carolina, long range transport is an issue. Now, ozone resides in two distinct regions of the atmosphere. There is ozone this is the surface of, this is planet Earth. Ozone resides near the surface of the Earth, which is also called the troposphere. However, there is a very large pool of ozone that resides 25 to 50 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, and that is called the stratosphere. Ozone that resides in the stratosphere is good for humankind. Ozone that resides near the surface of the Earth, that is in the lower troposphere, is bad for us. And I'll explain that in just a bit. Paradoxically, and this is the great paradox, ozone in the stratosphere is decreasing, and ozone in the troposphere is, is increasing. So that's and we want just the opposite. We want ozone in the stratosphere to increase 
and ozone near the surface of the Earth to decrease, as shown by the next slide. There is 30 miles above the, the ozone layer, which protects us from the ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun. An ozone molecule has this wonderful property that it absorbs UV radiation. And if we are exposed to UV radiation, it will cause cancer and other sorts of diseases. That layer is decreasing. The amount of ozone in the troposphere, which leads to the formation of smog and the like, is increasing. So we need to simply find a way to reverse that. Now this slide was the year 2000. In the year 2000, this uh, weekly magazine Spectator carried an article choking on ozone, how bad is our air? And this is the triangle area in Research Triangle Park. And you can see how vividly the air pollution had gotten quite bad the year 2000. Now, there are lots of issues that go into air pollution, meteorology being a very significant component of it. But nevertheless, from 2000 to almost 10 years later, things have improved. But here is the same year, 2000, and uh, this article suggested that Charlotte area was the eighth worst metropolitan statistical area in the country in terms of ozone pollution. Raleigh Durham was the 11th worst ozone pollution area in the country. And you can see, if you are below the green line, you don't have a problem. If you are between the green and the yellow, you can tolerate it. But once you get into the yellow and the orange range, the pollution has become quite severe. And when you get into red, it is quite bad and or serious. And certainly, when you get into this purple region, that's where Los Angeles is. Okay? But nevertheless, nevertheless, the year 2000, 2000, this is what we had to deal with. And here is, once again, you know, how we communicate with the general public, that is the newspaper, the media. You know, we give the weather on a daily basis. We now also give the air quality on a daily basis. And the way we communicate it is something like we do now for Homeland Security, the code orange and code green and code so on and so on. Similarly for air, by the way, that uh, uh, the Homeland Security issue for dealing with the public actually came from mm, the way we were dealing with air pollution to begin with. So, uh, so when we have a green code in a given region, it means the air is good. If it is yellow, it's moderate, and so on and on. What are the properties of ozone as a molecule? It has chemical properties, biological properties, and ecological properties. Chemically, it is a gas. It is soluble in water, therefore it is quite polar. It is very reactive and reacts with lots of compounds in the atmosphere to convert them into more harmful compounds in the atmosphere. However, it does have a distribution in the troposphere and stratosphere, as I explained to you a moment ago. Biologically, it produces free radicals, primarily the hydroxyl radical. And these radicals are extremely reactive once they are produced. It reacts with membranes. 
that's the mechanism by which ozone once it enters the plants through the stomata these tiny openings in the plants it interacts with the cellular and the membrane level to kill the plants as I will show you in some of the diagrams it is pre its precursors ozone that is formed is from both natural and anthropogenic sources and it attenuates UVB radiation which is good okay that means it absorbs UVB radiation which is uh, beneficial to us the humans ecologically it has very high deposition velocity that means it will settle down very quickly ie it will react with humans once we breathe and the like and it has a relatively short half life it is also a greenhouse gas it is one of those species that both absorbs UV radiation and it also absorbs infrared radiation as an absorber of infrared radiation it also acts as a greenhouse gas so right there we have there's a challenge facing us its lifetime in the atmosphere so I got all sorts of pollutants listed here and you can see ozone lifetime in the troposphere is moderately long-lived which is to say it exists in the troposphere from about few weeks to a few months so it persists for a reasonable amount of time therefore it can be transported over long distances so how is ozone formed which is what I will now speak to ozone is formed it is not emitted directly into the uh, into the atmosphere that means it is not a primary pollutant what it is, is is it is formed by chemical reactions in the atmosphere therefore it is classified as a secondary pollutant and what are those chemical reactions that go on to form uh, ozone in the atmosphere NOx which is oxides of nitrogen in combination of wallet in combination with volatile organic compounds which is VOCs react in presence of sunlight to produce ozone and I'll show you this chemical reaction simplistically in just a minute so where does NOx come from the largest single producer of NOx is transportation that's where largest amount of NOx in the atmosphere comes from the second largest producer is utilities coal burning or fossil fuel burning plants on the other hand VOCs the single largest producer of VOCs essentially isoprene which is a very reactive volatile organic compound is uh, emitted by trees and transportation so you can quickly begin to see why Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill the triad area and the Charlotte area would be copious amounts of ozone because I-40 and I-85 are running through these major metropolitan statistical areas producing NOx and VOCs which when they react in the atmosphere in presence of sunlight you will produce ozone so it stands to reason the only way you can bring ozone down is to somehow control either NOx or VOCs but here lies the debate is majority of the VOCs in this pie is from natural sources which is the trees and we can hardly do anything about that so the only thing we can realistically do to reduce ozone is to control NOx in this region from automotive exhaust that at the end of the day is all we can do so this is the chemical reactions that go on NMHC stands for non methane hydrocarbons VOC reacts with the hydroxyl radical in the atmosphere to produce 
a peroxy organic radical. Peroxy organic radical. This peroxy organic radical reacts with the second species, which is the nitric oxide, NO, NOx, that I talked about, to give us NO2, nitrogen dioxide. This is what is emitted by automotive exhaust. This is what gets formed in the atmosphere. And the photolysis, that is H nu, this means sunlight, that is NO2 reacting with sunlight, produces ozone. So in essence, the two precursors, NOx and VOCs, reacting in presence of sunlight, produce ozone. Now, let me take it a one step further in terms of the chemistry, and I will stop with the chemistry after this. The chemistry of the global atmosphere is controlled by this guy, which is OH, the hydroxyl radical that I showed you a moment ago. That's what controls almost all the chemistry that goes on in the global atmosphere. Hydroxyl radical reacts with SO2, which is emitted by power plants, to produce sulfuric acid, which leads to sulfates. Hydroxyl radical reacts with the VOCs to produce secondary organic aerosols, but it also produces peroxy hydroxyl radical that I showed you a moment ago. Peroxy, uh, peroxy hydroxyl radical reacts with NO to produce NO2, which is fertilized to give us the ozone. And along the way, we produce nitric acid and hydroperoxide, H2O2. Now, this is where the role of ammonia comes in. Ammonia, which is emitted by agricultural processes predominantly, 98% of all ammonia, at least in North Carolina, comes from agricultural processes. And that reacts with nitric acid, that reacts with sulfuric acid, that reacts with organic acids to produce the corresponding aerosols which are very harmful to human health. This is what the change in ozone during the day looks like. Going from 12 midnight to 12 midnight, this is 12 noon here. So sunlight is required to produce ozone, as I explained to you a moment ago. Therefore, concentrations of troposphere ozone are normally high during the afternoons and during the summer months when sunlight is more intense, and that's exactly what we see. At night, ozone concentration is low. When the sunlight comes out, it begins to rise, and shortly after noon, it peaks and then drops back down again. So the diurnal profile of ozone, no matter where you go, except at high elevation, and I'll show you that in a minute, will look something like this. And as you increase the temperature, i.e. during summer, it'll even be larger amounts of ozone being produced because we have more sunlight in the northern hemisphere during summer. This is what happens when you are on a mountain. Okay? And these measurements were made in Asheville, which is, so if you can think of the mountain as a tall tower, and in fact, Mount Mitchell is 2,000 meters tall, so if you can think of it that way, the base of the mountain is low elevation, so we see a diurnal profile. As you start going up the mountain at 17, 60 meters high, there is no profile whatsoever. It's relatively constant. So that means you are being exposed at high elevation to ozone values, high values all the time. And as you go even higher in elevation, the profile reverses itself. That is, at night, there is more ozone than during
during the day. Now that might seemingly seem like a paradox, but it isn't actually. And there is a good explanation for that. And 10 years ago, when my research group was working on Mount Mitchell as part of Mountain Cloud Chemistry program, we observed that and we were able to explain this rather meaningfully. And what we see in this slide is the distribution of ozone on planet Earth. Southern Hemisphere, South Pole, Samoa, these are all Southern Hemisphere locations and Northern Hemisphere locations. We see more ozone in the Northern Hemisphere than in the Southern Hemisphere. And that stands to reason because in the Northern Hemisphere, we have more industrial activity, more automobiles, more utilities. In Southern Hemisphere, we don't. So the distribution of ozone in the Southern Hemisphere is considerably lesser than it is in the Northern Hemisphere. Now to control a pollutant, the US Environmental Protection Agency has put forward what is called the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. And ozone is a criteria pollutant, which means there is a National Ambient Air Quality Standard for ozone, both a primary standard and a secondary standard. Primary standard means it is set to, lim to it limits to protect public health, where a secondary standard is set to protect public welfare. So our welfare, which is vegetation and material and the like, is protected by the secondary standard, and the primary standard is set for human health-related issues. And here is the standard for ozone. Up until 1997, the ozone standard was 0.12 ppm, not to exceed 0.12 ppm concentration over one hour. So you took the, you measured concentration of ozone continuously, averaged it over one hour, and if that value was less than 0.12 ppm, you were in good shape. However, it exceeded 0.12 ppm, then you had an exceedance. And if you had three exceedances over three years, then you had a violation. So that's how we keep a track of it. However, the standard was changed in 1997. Instead of a one hour standard, it was made into an eight hour standard, and the value was 0 0.08. Because the argument that was made was, well, we are exposed not to high values all the time. We are exposed to you know, a, ba a band of value all the time, and what is this average value that we are exposed to? Is that more detrimental to us? And then in 2008, the standard was tightened even further, and so the new ozone standard that we are operating under now is 0 0.075 ppm, not to be exceeded for eight hour averages of ozone concentration. That's the new standard. And so here are some of the effects and consequences of these effects. Once again, ozone is formed by the interaction of NOx, oxides of nitrogen, is presence of volatile organic compounds, and the sunlight is what triggers this reaction to give us ozone. Okay. It has an impact on vegetation, and you can see how the crops begin to be affected. The Beijing Olympics 2008, the main issue in terms of Beijing Olympic that caught the imagination of the world was the smog in Beijing and it was largely ozone. So here is meant to reflect that uh, the ozone problem in Beijing. And you know the solution that they came up with was to shut down all the 
factories surrounding Beijing and then move them out into, the, into, into, into rural areas and so on and on and on. Well, nevertheless, the effects of ozone, it leads to the formation, helps in the formation of acid rain. Certainly, it is a very important constituent of smog and it leads to the formation of fine particulate matter PM5. It leads to enhanced respiratory diseases, excess amount of ozone if you were to breathe. It leads to premature mortality depending on the population, the aged and the young you know. And it certainly has damage to crops and material as shown right here and I will show you some additional slides in a minute. And so the consequences of all these effects is that we need to have control programs if we are to have effective air quality in the region that we live in. And inevitably all this leads to restricted industrial development in the places where we have an air pollution problem. It is primarily for this reason that in eastern North Carolina where we have a intensive agricultural problem, no industry wants to re relocate there, there because they don't want to have to go clean up that place you know. That has to be dealt by the industry that happens to be there already. So, so is the case with if we have an ozone problem the industry is reluctant which has direct economic consequences. So, I am going to show you next few slides on how crops are damaged and how this study gets done. So, here are plants primarily soya beans healthy looking soya beans and we expose them to ozone concentrations in what is called open top chambers. So, these are chambers in which we bring in ozone at a known concentration we expose them for a bunch of hours and then we look at what is the damage that gets done and then we compare them with plants that are not exposed to ozone. Here is another experiment and which is a more sophisticated way of looking at exposure to plants which is called a face experiment which is a free air ozone experiment in which there are no walls ozone comes out through these pipes depending on the wind direction and it blows over the plants. So, there are no wall reactions. So, these are sophisticated advancements on how exposure studies get done. And here are some studies that we did in what is called a continuously stirred tank reactor in which we expose plants to ozone and other pollutants. So, here are different ways of trying to look at effects on vegetation. For the record that is how it is done on humans also. You have a chamber which is located at UNC Chapel Hill and in this chamber we expose human subjects to a variety of different pollutants and then we see what the impact would be. <laughs> but we do not nearly take them to very high values. <laughs> to, do, <laughs> to do that we rely on human models which are really rats and cats and, and whatever else you know and we expose uh, them. So, here is an open top chamber experiment in which the soya bean plant was exposed 25 parts per billion which is not very high value for 12 hours and you can see the damage on the plant. And the congressional office calculated that the total loss to the US economy was somewhere between 2 and 5 billion dollars. 10 years ago, not today, 10 years ago. They have not calculated that number now, but that is what it was then. So, that is a substantial number to be worried about. And so, here is the effect of ozone on yields of crops for different crops sorghum, field corn and so on and ultimately cotton. The decrease in yield going in this direction and increasing ozone concentration and the ambient ozone value is between about 45 to about 65 parts per billion. And we see that as you increase ozone concentration the yield for the crop declines. So, clearly these studies 
have clearly shown us that there is an impact on vegetation associated with elevated levels and ambient levels of ozone. Now the good news, and there is some good news. <laughs> the US Environmental Protection Agency makes measurements of ozone in a variety of different locations around the country. To be exact, 258 locations. So from 1980 to 2008, over almost a 30 year period, so this is going 1980 to 2008, ozone concentration in PPM and this dashed line is the standard, 0 0.075 ppm. If you are above it, bad news. If you are below it, you're doing fine, okay? What do we see? That indeed, the ozone concentration, nation as a whole, is coming down. But it is not down enough so that the problem has gone away. The problem, there are still a variety of regions where the ozone continues to persist above this value. How about North Carolina? And that's what I'll focus on. Ozone is measured at all these blue dots location that you see here in the state of North Carolina. And what do you see predominantly in the triangle area, in the triad area? and in this corridor right here. Essentially, along I-85 and along I-40. Okay, those are the communities for the reasons that I shared with you a little while ago will produce the precursors to ozone formation. So this is where we are at right now in this region. And what do we see? North Carolina eight-hour ozone non-attainment. That is, regions that have monitors that have the yellow dot is non-attainment between 76 parts per billion. 0 0.075 is 75 parts per billion with a B. And to 84 and beyond 85, that's called a serious non-attainment. And what do we see? Where we are right now, we do have a serious problem uh, as it relates to ozone between these measurements were made for 2006 to 2008 because the new standard came into being in 1997 and we are only looking at three years at a time. So we have a serious problem here still, but the problem is quite pervasive in the triangle area, the triad area, and in this area. Okay. And so a monitor is then trans translated into the region that it might affect. And the same monitor then, all these regions shown right here, are have a ozone-related problem. But there is some good news here too. It's not entirely all that bad. So let's look at the statewide air quality considering ozone. So only for ozone. 1998 to 2008, up until, 19, nine, up until 2008, the, uh, the standard was 0 0.085. From 1997 to 2008, the standard was, ozone standard was 0 0.08 ppm over eight hours. The standard was made more stringent. What we see is for the state of North Carolina, the ozone has continued to decrease largely the state as a whole, but in certain pockets, it continues to be a nagging problem. And those pockets are, number one, the Charlotte region, number two, 
the triangle region, and number three, the triad region. But nevertheless, the good news is we have been able to manage and bring the ozone concentration down over the last 10 years quite a bit. And this shows us during which months do we have the most problem, and indeed, June, July, and August, the maximum number of days is when you have the ozone problem. So June, July, and August, that is because we have high temperature and more sunlight. Now going from west to east, from the mountains in the state of North Carolina all the way to the coast, which is really Rocky Mount. It's not at the coast, but close enough. And what do we see? We have an ozone problem in Charlotte. We have an ozone problem in the triad, Greensboro. And we have an ozone problem in Raleigh-Durham, where this, the red line, is the standard. If you are above the red line, the concentration is above the red line, you have an ozone problem. If you are below the red line, you are in good shape. And indeed, this is where, which is Charlotte. But that too has some good news. This is ozone concentration in parts per million in Mecklenburg County in North Carolina from 1994 to 1996, all the way to 2007, 2009. There has been an improvement. We are not there yet, there meaning 0 0.075, which will be somewhere here. We are still above the standard, but there has been a steady decline in our ability to manage and control ozone in the region. Same is true for Raleigh Durham. The ozone has declined over the last 10 years. But it's still not below the point zero seven five, the new standard. And this data was collected by the state of North Carolina. They have monitoring stations around the state. So you simply go ask for it, and they provide it to you, and you can do the analysis associated with it. Now I'm going to spend some time in a research realm and show you some uh, exciting research. Now, as Professor Veer pointed out, ozone is not just a local issue. It is also a regional issue. And I'm going to show you the regionality of this issue. So North Carolina, Candor, North Carolina, OK? Candor is somewhere halfway between Raleigh and Charlotte here. So Candor is, OK? And the second place, keep in mind, is Auburn, North Carolina, which is slightly southeast of Raleigh, these two locations. My students did an experiment there. Two different experiments altogether, completely different. And the idea of the experiment was to figure out how much ozone advex? The word advex means how much ozone is brought into the region. If that ozone is brought into the region, you can do paltry little about it, because that's what comes in. You have no control over it. So you got to build from there. If you, go, if you add that to what you're already making in the region, then you really have a serious problem. So the idea was to figure out how much ozone is being brought into the state of North Carolina? That's what we were trying to figure out. And the first way we did it was in Candor, North Carolina, and this is results from Candor, North Carolina, we made measurements of the precursors. 
NOI minus NOx. This is how, when NOx, which is oxides of nitrogen, gets transformed into nitric acid and the like. That is what this difference means, and ozone concentration on the y-axis. So on the x-axis, you have essentially oxides of nitrogen. On the y-axis, you have ozone. When you mathematically take NOx to zero, you extrapolate this line, you'll come to about 30 parts per billion. So 30 parts per billion is what is coming into the state of North Carolina. No control over it. That's the regional issue. And these measurements were made by a variety of other investigators around the whole southeast. This is Candor, North Carolina, which is these dots right there. Giles County, Tennessee, in Alabama, Metro Georgia, and model that we ran, modeling exercise that we did. They all fall along a similar curve. And when you extrapolate this curve, you come to about 30 parts per billion when there is no NOx in the region. That means you're not, you are not producing any ozone. That value is 30 parts per billion. The second issue is to, you can see that as you change NOx, ozone goes up and down. As you decrease the oxides of nitrogen, you decrease ozone. So the control strategy that is left with you is to be able to control oxides of nitrogen, the precursor oxide of nitrogen. And the third issue here is the slope of this curve. And the slope is height over this over this. That's what the slope is. Rise over run. And the slope of this curve is about 12. What does that mean? That means for every molecule of NOx, you're making 12 molecules of ozone. That means NOx is very proficient in making ozone. So from this one curve, you can determine a lot of information. But the most important one was the background ozone that is brought into the state of North Carolina. We did an entirely different experiment, which is, here is a tower. Can anybody guess how tall that tower is? This tower is a little over half a kilometer tall. This tower, from here to the top, is a little over half a kilometer tall. Okay? And this is located in the southeast of Raleigh. Okay? And we instrumented this tower for ozone measurements. So we made measurements of ozone right up there, here, here, and here. Believe it or not, but we did it. <laughs> OK? In the name of science. OK? So let's look at this. So this is measurements made at the top of the tower, 433 meters, a little below the top. And this is ozone measurements made at the surface of the tower. Between 0 and 4 a.m., that is early hours of the morning, and this is between 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., middle of the day, when you form the most amount of ozone. That's when the top and the bottom are decoupled atmospherically. There is a planetary boundary layer that decouples the top from the bottom. So what is happening up there will not influence what is happening on the surface. And so if you extrapolate this line, what do you get? 30 parts per billion. Two entirely different experiments led to the same conclusion, which is the background ozone value coming into the state of North Carolina is 30 parts per billion. That's the regionality of ozone. Now let's look at some modeling exercises. So here is an integrated assessment. And that's what we have to do, is to look at ozone in a very holistic way. To do that, we need to know all the emission sources for the precursors. We need to know the chemical transformations. We need to understand the transport, and then examine exposure, damage, and evaluation. 
And that's the model was published by a student of mine in environmental science and technology. So you look at the meteorology, which is the transport related issue, how the meteorology moves the pollutants around. Emissions of the precursors, NOx and VOCs, the chemical transformations that you determine in the laboratory, but you feed it into the model and out pops the ozone concentration and then you look at exposure and socioeconomic and on and on and on. And so these models are used and here is a three, it's, here is a, 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 a video that takes us from August 14th to August 17th. August 14th will come in a minute. That's when the ozone started, maximum amount of ozone. As you moved into August 15th, the ozone became slightly more, but by the 16th and 17th, oh, so we now have sophisticated models that allow us to examine the ozone concentration in a very holistic way. Here is sample, a similar model, sample air quality forecast guidance, and indeed, now the federal government, more specifically US EPA, has started to predict ozone, much the way we predict temperature. We are now able to predict ozone, i.e. the air quality. And so we have an ozone problem here, that's in, right there in North Carolina. Atlanta has a serious ozone problem. And so if you look at this in a little more, more magnified way, this is where we are. So mathematically, through modeling exercises, we can indeed show that there is an ozone problem in the region we are here today. And similarly, there is an ozone problem in Atlanta, which is this. So we can do county by county by county. We can be very fine in our evaluation. 